So we're going to start this panel and have me welcome the three speakers, and in particular, particular Tom Campanella, who's going to start with this. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Um, and thank you to the uh, Historic Districts Council for inviting me here to speak today. We have in uh, New York City a remarkable legacy of 20th century parks and infrastructure that uh, some of which we are, we are only just now uh, getting around to appreciating as meaningful and significant works of creative intent. Uh, much of this uh, is the fruit of the Moses era <clears throat> and the work of an extraordinary but largely <clears throat> forgotten group of designers and engineers, uh, men as well as women, that made up the Moses Brain Trust, as it's been called. Some of this legacy has already been lost in that elusive interregnum between the creation of a landscape or a piece of infrastructure and the moment when society finally deems it worthy of preservation. This <clears throat> 1936 scheme here for City Hall Park, for example, <clears throat> was swept away when the Giuliani administration dialed the space back to the Vic Victorian period. Now, the Moses era, era plan uh, here uh, was perhaps uh, no masterpiece, um, but it was rich with design intent, and I'll, I'll, I'll say more about this in, in a moment. The uncredited authors of much of the Moses landscape were the landscape architects and urbanists, Gilmore D. Clark and Michael Rapuano. I'll, I'll introduce them by way of their work, uh, which will also show how some very quotidian elements of the city's landscape, roads, trees, uh, asphalt pavers even, uh, have in fact uh, roots and meaning and, and cultural value. And I'll start at the regional scale and work uh, my way uh, down, ending up literally on the pavement. Contrary to, um, contrary to what is uh, implied uh, in R Robert Caro's uh, The Power Broker, uh, Robert Moses did not invent out of whole cloth this vision of a metropolitan region laced with parks and parkways. He carted it lock, stock, and barrel from Westchester County, where Gilmore Clark had pioneered the use of parkways to create what was really the, the first park system of the motor age. This was Olmsted in the automobile, um, the, uh, the bounded sanctuary of Central Park, uh, distributed now across, uh, uh, across a vast land area and all tied up together by these green parkway tendrils. I'm a little behind on my images. That's Gilmore Clark on the left, Mike Rapuano um, on the right, <clears throat> one of the Westchester parkways. Now, Moses adapted the Westchester model, as it was known, to create the Long Island State park system in the 1920s and a decade later to, and I'm quoting Moses here, weave together the loose strands and frayed edges of New York's metropolitan tapestry. And he very wisely recruits Clark and Rapuano to lead this effort. That on the left is the Westchester County park system. Like their earlier work in Westchester, the parkways that Clark and Rapuano create in New York are not just arterials, but amenity-rich recreational corridors that also happen to contain a motorway. The Henry Hudson Parkway is um, the most spectacular in this regard, as it involved the, the, uh, the wholesale redevelopment of Riverside Park. But the most extensive was the so-called, or originally named, Circumferential Parkway through Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, today's uh, Belt, Southern, Cross Island, and Laurelton Parkways. Moses himself uh, described the project as, and I'm quoting here, not just an automobile roadway, but a narrow shoestring park, including all sorts of recreation facilities for people in the neighborhoods along the route. 
including, I might add, uh, what is still the uh, longest stretch of Class I bikeway uh, in the city. These are both of the Bell Parkway. It's a Bay Ridge and, and uh, near um, Plum Beach. Clark and Rapuano also played a key role in the great park renewal campaign that Moses launched in 1934. And this is where Rapuano especially uh, comes to leave his mark on the city. That's Mike Rapuano on the left at the Villa Desta in Tivoli. Rapuano was a crack designer whom Clark uh, put in charge of a hand-picked skunk works of sorts within the department, within the parks department, that was responsible for all, for all park planning and design. And Rapuano uh, and many of his staff uh, had studied in Italy at the American Academy in Rome, uh, and they put their knowledge of Renaissance precedents to work here now. They apply them to create um, a fresh and lean, what I've called a public works Baroque uh, design idiom uh, for the entire park system. Among other things, this involved the extensive use of ramps, terraces, curving coordinate, symmetrical layout about a central axis, and the use of forced perspective uh, to either truncate or extend the apparent depth of a space. He uses it here at Reese Park, uh, and here, this is at a, at a much greater scale. This is, the, is Mike Rapuano's master plan for the 1939 uh, World's Fair in Flushing um, Meadow Park. Um, and here you can see, again, uh, a battery park that uh, forced perspective. And uh, the, again, this is City Hall Park here, which we started uh, out at. And in fact, the City Hall Park move was literally transcribed from the upper fountain cascade at the Villa Aldobrandini in Frascati uh, here. He just turns this uh, axis about 20 degrees or so, so that it lines up actually uh, on uh, St. Saint, Saint Paul's right here. The plant material that of the Moses era park also bears more meaning than one might expect. Uh, and here too we see the influence of Clark and Rapuano. As I wrote recently in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the piece is actually in the supplemental packet that you have, uh, and I'm quoting myself here now, uh, it's, it, it's long been a mystery in New York just how the London plane tree, uh, Platinus acerifolia, came to have such presence in the city. As you all know, the tree dominates many streets and most of the smaller parks and playgrounds in the city. And it turns out that the root stock, uh, so to speak, of the Gotham Plain tree was Rome and the conduit, um, uh, Mike Rapuano. These are plane trees in Cadman Park in Brooklyn. Now, as this, um, and, and I should say, R Respighi uh, and his Pines of Rome, notwithstanding, Rome is really a city of plains, not pines, uh, as this uh, street tree census from 1890 shows. The top arrow there, that's the number of plane trees, and the little bump there down there is Respighi. Um, uh, <laughs> And like uh, Xerxes of Lore, Rapuano falls in love with this tree and effectively transplants it to New York, where it becomes a Moses favorite, uh, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the leaf uh, the, uh, becomes the identity, the symbol of the Parks Department. This is uh, uh, a pentagram's uh, uh, updated identity for the uh, Parks Department. Rapuano even adopts a specific technique of plane tree planting from Italy, a dense gridded grove or boschetti, which becomes another signature element of the Moses era uh, parkscape. And his source here uh, again is the Villa Aldo Brandini, specifically the boschetti that flank either side of the palazzo, which you see here. These, were, these trees were planted around 1611. They're still clinging to life. Um, I like to uh, think uh, of this as the, the mother grove um, that Rapuano uh, channels uh, to create some of New York's iconic uh, spaces. Uh, the lower portions of Riverside Park, for example, 
uh, Cadman Plaza Park up at the top, which I showed you a shot of uh, a minute ago, uh, Red Hook Swimming Pool, um, Leif Erikson Park too. This is not a, a photo of Leif Erikson. There's many examples of this. <clears throat> the London Plain along with the Crab Apple, <laughs> thank you, uh, and English Ivy were part of a standardized palette of plant materials, furniture, and site details used uh, citywide in the 1930s, and that even today uh, help give the Moses era park its distinctive identity. There's also granite Belgian block, large aggregate concrete formwork, bluestone flagging, black iron uh, railings, and hoop planter edging those wonderful World's Fair benches, and the ubiquitous hexagonal asphalt pavers that you see here, known as Hastings Block. And you can see a lot of the classic elements in this photo uh, right here. In terms of preservation, uh, these plant and hardscape materials are especially difficult to protect, protect in the face of renovations and improvements. Uh, I'll put that in quotes. In Marine Park, where I grew up in Brooklyn, all the granite Belgian block was mysterious, mysteriously replaced several years ago, I still haven't uh, figured out why, by rather cheap um, cast concrete pavers. There is probably not a single Moses playground in the city that has its original complement of hazardous but fun uh, equipment <laughs> like uh, like, like um, uh, monkey bars uh, and, um, and seesaws. And I, there's one item I, I forgot to show you here. There, there may actually be a Rome connection with the, um, the hexagonal pavers. It's something I'm looking into right now. Uh, as I said, many of the landscape architects that worked uh, in the design division of the Parks Department in this period uh, had studied at the American Academy in Rome where uh, nearly all the floors are paved with these wonderful hexagonal tiles which are more or less the exact same size as the hex the um, this was actually uh, this was actually Mike Rapuano's studio at the American Academy in Rome it was most more recently Robert Hammond's studio um, <laughs> plant material uh, in closing, uh, is even uh, more uh, fleeting still. Uh, trees age and die and fall and are often replaced by a different species. In an effort to reduce uh, the hazards of, of monoculture, uh, the Parks Department actually no longer plants a London Plain. And this, of course, has serious implications for design integrity. Interplanting ginkgo or ash among the plane trees at Cadman uh, or Bryant Park might uh, be wise from an ecological standpoint, uh, but it would also uh, destroy the defining uh, spatial element of those landscapes. Thank you.